Hello and welcome to the post-COVID productivity debate. Uh, we are excited to join you. We're going to be talking about um, what some economists think reducing unemployment would boost, which is output. Um, others advocate greater use of robots. Um, some others believe that the sustainable development goals set out by the UN could be the key to uh, advancing some of our ethical well-being goals um, and balancing those goals with the need for profits. Uh, another aspect is with the Great Resignation, how do we get unemployed but fit people to return to productivity and productive activity? Um, and then also in the light of coming out of COVID and lockdown, how do we redefine what productive even means in the light of the sustainable world? Uh, I am joined by some wonderful panelists, and I will let them all introduce themselves. But just quickly, I'd like to run through our panelists. We have Lyra Hughes-Hale, Editor-in-Chief of EconView USA. We have Catherine Carlton, former mayor of Menlo Park, uh, current co-founder at Sapiens Impact. We have Rohit Guy, CEO of RSA USA, and... We are also joined by Chris Rose, CEO of MR Access Inc. So welcome everybody. And uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit more of an intro, just to, to give us a few lines about yourself and uh, happy to have you all join us. Let's start with Lyric. Yes, hi, happy to join everyone today. I'm editor-in-chief of EconView. Uh, we have newsletters and podcasts and analysis of global economic issues. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from Chicago, um, head of a lot of economics, I think. So um, what I'd like to talk about briefly, uh, looking at the topics, I think that the answers to your questions uh, really depend upon the country that you're talking about. And I think we have divided into the global south and the global north. I think the sanctions on Russia and so forth and tensions with China are accelerating uh, that trend. But what country are we talking about? In some countries, there are labor shortages. And in other countries, there um, are, is high unemployment, very high unemployment. So the, and right now, if we do have this divide, the answers have to be separated according to that divide. So robots, for example, generally do the work of the least employable people. Um, so of the least skilled people. So is that accomplishing what we want to, or as a, as a world, do we want to give more people with fewer skills, more jobs? Is that a goal that we have? Um, strangely enough, the most automated countries, like the United States, have witnessed the biggest falls in productivity. We had a historic 7.5% fall in productivity last month, which is the greatest fall since 1949. And if we're talking about productivity, let's look at the work of Robert Gordon, a professor of economics here at Northwestern. He's written all of the greatest works on that subject and should have a Nobel. I don't know why he doesn't yet. But, you know, he said that the, the great age of, of productivity leaps is over. And the kind of things that, you know, electricity, railroads, all of those things created productivity gains. But that what we're talking about, the things that we notice now um, in terms of our own lives, we we're talking about this earlier on the panel, social media and um you know, toys like Oculus and entertainment, those things entertain us, but they don't really make us more productive and they don't add to societal production, but they're fun. So well, I think that's, that's an interesting point. And I think it was uh, Kathy. That it, the technology is aimed at kind of rest inward and, and not really generating that productivity outward. So that really speaks to your point. Okay. Wow. Right. So, you know, population is demographics is destiny and all of this depends on demographics, really. Um, mm -hmm. Just to give you one little potential um, factoid, it's possible if China, for example, um, uh, does not achieve its population goals, 
and the U.S. exceeds them by just a little bit, according to the to UN projections, that by the end of the century, there'll be more Americans than Chinese citizens. So think about what that means over time. Also, we're about to experience an emerging market debt crisis. As interest rates rise here, there was $100 trillion of, dollars of debt in, in, in de less developed markets, and <clears throat> there's no way they're going to pay them back um, while the dollar is strengthening because they're dollar-dominated. And much of their debt also is held by China. So I think we're really, um, what I'm underlining, I think, is that I think that the world is splitting in two. There's a bifurcation coming. And people who are able to develop solutions to trans for translation between those two worlds are going to develop, are going to enhance productivity. Because a bifurcated world is less productive, less efficient, more expensive, and slower. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I, I think that that leads quite nicely into um, what Catherine does with her work with Sapiens Impact. Um, what is it that you've seen in your work so far in, in trying to organize organizations to, to get, have maximum impact on kind of achieving some of the sustainable development goals in a way that does increase productivity? Well, you have to take a step back and, and look at, first of all, define what is productivity and which productivity we're, we're discussing. Uh, my, I, I have a quirky background. I ran tech companies in uh, the UK and, and throughout Asia. I moved to the United States. I spent 10 years in politics and I've recently retired and now I've set up a, an impact hub for people to come together and support each other and share ideas uh, for the different levels of impact. Uh, I define that as people, the planet and the environment um, we like to narrow things down, right? And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, of the ideas of the fourth industrial revolution. Of course, the first, the first was steam, then there was electricity, the third was data, and the fourth is how is the systems integrating together. And the productivity that I see coming, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yes and what was said before, the productivity that I see is coming through the cyber physical systems. Uh, we were talking before we started about the Jetsons and I'm very involved because of my experience with city and technology, I'm very involved in advising people on smart city technology. And one might argue we're not as advanced as the Jetsons because we're not flying, but I would say we're, we're much more advanced in many ways than the Jetsons in terms of, of the fact one, really interesting example of productivity is what Neuralink is doing and companies like that are, are really putting uh, the blurring the lines between what's happening with the biology development and the tech development. They have something they can put in the head of a quadriplegic and that quadriplegic person can then fly a drone and have a job, for example, in a warehouse taking stock. You know, it gives them the ability to, to uh, participate in the work life, to have a more enriched environment. There's so many different things that are happening on that level that are really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that I see is there are a lot of really good ideas, very hard to scale them. And that's mm -hmm. where we have to enable people to find the others, whether that's finding the mentors, finding the partners, finding the money, uh, finding the, the cross-pollination of ideas. One of the things that I think that prevents us from being able to expand as much as we could otherwise at opportunity cost is that biologists run around in kind of biologist circles and people working in education may work in this section. And, and we need to get out of our, our usual environments and have those cross-pollination ideas because occasionally that's what's so fun about when, please, I hope the horaces starts becoming... Uh, in person again, is that getting coffee, you can meet someone who you absolutely would not have necessarily heard them speak because you didn't think that was something that applied to you, but it'll spark a new idea. And that is magic. That is just beautiful. And I, I love seeing that coming together. So, and, and I think that we have that here. I think that we've got a, a really interesting panel of people. So I look forward to, to hearing what my colleagues have to say. Well, we absolutely do have a wonderful panel, and I think that, um, you know, just kind of 
in connection to what you were just speaking about, uh, I'd love to introduce you to Sarah Isbell, who's a neuroscientist and is developing um, really innovative treatments for neurodegenerative conditions. Sarah, um, maybe you might want to kind of uh, give your perspective on what <laughs> not siloing biologists and other folks <laughs> putting all together and, and kind of um, your spin on productivity from your perspective. Well, thank you, Carol, and thank you for having me today. Um, I'll first say we're not working on treatment. Um, we, it's not like we've, we've developed something that um, will actually, you know, stop anything with degeneration or trauma. What we did was we uncovered the sole reason why nothing has worked so far. Um, that will be for a whole nother probably conference um, one day, but pretty much what everyone else has tried and has failed is a good chance it's gonna work now because we figured out why things haven't quite worked. But um, I do want to touch on the Oculus um, <laughs> because I've actually found that it has allowed me to go global with my reach. Um, I use uh, one of the software programs called Workrooms, and I have a broker in Switzerland, a broker in Malaysia, and we will meet on there, and it's like a, a real office. So, you know, if you you use the tools to actually get yourself out there networking and to do stuff, of course. But a lot of people weren't going to do that, right? You kind of get on it. And there's all this other distraction that goes along with it. Every time I turn it on, there's all these new apps, all this, you know. And, and I, I solely use it for, you know, to get work done because we're stuck at home. Um, I live here in the States in California. So I think for me, I'm thinking, you know, it's like, who's going to teach all this stuff? I hear it where everyone says, like, um, I hear you saying, there's a lot of good ideas. And, you know, how many jobs are we going to have at the high end, low end? You know, that's so many, it's very interesting, right? Those ideas. But who is the one, who are we going to all follow, right? There's so many voices. And how long are we going to talk? And, you know, I just, I always wonder how's that ever going to condense down to just is it going to be the people who have the most money the country and and that really um i think a lot about that because when this breakthrough that we have comes out and i'm not one scientist never say they're 100 percent right and i am a true scientist and i never say we have it we didn't mean to find it i didn't want to be a ceo of a company we did it out of necessity because when you see something that we did, you, you have to devote your life to it. So it's been 10 years now. I often wonder where I'm not going out to meet investors because I'm not sure what country. Isn't that strange? I'm afraid that when this goes big, whatever, this is going to be real game changing. This is the stop of Alzheimer's and everything. And um, I'll go on record to say what, that now. What are Just some the main conditions is, that, that would be treated by your um, breakthrough. Well, everything. They know how to treat uh, all this stuff. They know what targets to knock out in the brain, and you'll stop the immune system. You'll stop the neuron firing. And those are the only two problems that exist in everything, whether it's stroke or TBI or um, Alzheimer's, any sort of degeneration or brain tissue damage either has the immune system or the neurons are overfiring. And then because they overfire, the immune system comes. Because the immune system's there, they overfire. So scientists know how to stop that process, but you'd stop it in the whole brain. You don't know how, and that will, the toxicity is just unacceptable. But we found a way to make that damage mm -hmm. make its own drug when the damage is there. So now you take what is a pre-drug. It's not the fully completed drug Everybody's already has a cure for all these things. They just have to not fully make their drug. Give it to them when it's not quite done. And then the damage does it when the damage comes. And it'll inhibit that target. This well, is such a game changer. And I wonder, is that going to throw everything off? If all of a sudden, what if you could cure Alzheimer's? What if all this stuff, all of a sudden you take a pill, it'd be a pill, and it's just like a cold or something. I mean, is that going to really turn the tables you're going to have is I know there's a huge economic just 
disruption. And then that just gets me thinking, is this all going to come down to the country that has, you know, the most money? As someone was saying, you know, what would that like China or, um, you know, because whoever, so many different people have different good ideas, right? So how do we all come and and get one and go forward? Like we're going to have this many high tech jobs. We're going to put this much in education. We're going to motivate people, you know. I don't know. I could go on and on. Well, it's hopefully really we be able to get to a point where such a breakthrough would be um, widely available. I mean, that would be the ultimate goal. But I think this is a perfect point uh, to talk about some synergy you might have with our other panelist, Chris Rose, as well, because um, you might be able to quantify um, how well those drugs are doing and the impact they're having on the brain with the help of Chris's company, which is MR Access, which uh, is making MRI scans and and radiological diagnoses much more affordable and accessible all around the world. Um, Chris, would that be something that, you know, definitely would apply here? I think so. Um, Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, Catherine, I relate to your quirky background comment. Um, I think for purposes of this discussion, that's called labor reallocation. Um, <laughs> I've done that myself a couple of times. And uh, yeah, I am a, I'm CEO of a startup MRI and radiology services company. Um, and we, it's a, it's a small, we're developing a small, low cost, but clinically powerful MRI device, networking it through the cloud, all the instrumentations done at the cloud, and then developing AI diagnostics protocols. Um, so we really are going to make we're going to make MRI available anywhere, and it's a it's a great tool. That's great. It doesn't emit uh, uh, radiation into the body, and uh, amazing. So um, yeah, and it's 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 a uh, it's IP developed out of uh, Columbia University primarily. But um, so uh, but prior to that, I was uh, I was with a large hotel company for. 27 years. So this discussion about productivity, um, I think it does depend on, you know, what kind of position it is. You know, some jobs I think can be replaced by robotics, you know, others really can't, you can't, you can't change that human, uh, human contact where that's needed. That can't be replaced by robots. And, um, you know, there's certain positions that, that, can and they can. It's going to be an interesting dynamic as we go forward here with, you know, office workers, for example, probably are more productive. Than, uh, but one point that we're, I just want to mention about the productivity related to what we're doing. Um, radiology as a, as a profession is at an inflection point. There are too few radiologists for the for the number of scans that are being produced. Mm -hmm. Um, Bright medical students typically aren't doing their residencies generally, uh, uh, not in radiology because they think they'll be replaced by machine learning. And it'll be longer than what what, uh, people are projecting, but it is a problem. And there's a need for more scans today. And I guess also kind of related to today's topic, Post-COVID, um, with COVID-related illnesses and long COVID, there's going to be more need for imaging to look inside the body, see what's going on. And um, what we're doing is, um, you know, developing uh, algorithms. We've created a device that works very well with AI. Um, it's standardized output, so the machine learning process is very efficient. And um, we'll help with this. Uh, a radiologist today reads one, one radiologist reads 8,000 scans per year. Um, we'll get to a point where one radiologist reads 200,000 scans per year. Wow. Because, uh, of AI. So, um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. And there definitely will be more and more of a need for this, as you said, with long COVID. Just uh, mm. so- the longer we live with this disease, the more we're, we're learning and, and um, the more that we need to assess about it. Um, so that brings us to Rohit, which 
Uh, Rohit is the CEO of RSA, which is, is really well known uh, throughout the world, but especially in San Francisco, um, where I'm based, makes quite a bit of news because of the RSA conference, which is upcoming. Um, welcome, Rohit. I'd love to have you join this discussion about productivity and how cybersecurity kind of fits into the whole mix as well. Well, thank you, Carol, and uh, great to join this panel. Uh, like you noted, I'm CEO of RSA. We are, I like to say, the first pure place cybersecurity company on the planet. Our mission is to, you founded out of the academia, uh, MIT. So our, our name uh, is basically the last, uh, the first letters of the last things of the three cryptographers who came up with a crypto system that basically protects all communications that flows over the internet today. And our mission now is to make sure we protect the world from digital risk, protect the identities of people, because at the end of the day, you know, we live in a world which is cyber physical, to borrow Kathy's kind of phrase from earlier, where digital and physical is blending. There are human actors and there are machine actors uh, conducting work on our behalf. And as such, we have to make sure the malicious threat actors don't disrupt the progress that we all seek and the productivity that we all seek. So we, we our, our mission is to make sure we consume technology on a responsible basis and a safe basis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, as it pertains to the topic at hand, productivity, I want to, again, touch on the point that Lyric raised earlier around, hey, we have to go find a grain. We could look at it maybe on a country by country basis. Maybe building on that point, I think we have to look at it particularly on a sector by sector basis and a discipline by discipline basis, you know, we'll have rebalancing of labor and the needs will shift in cybersecurity. As an example, it's the industry with the highest negative unemployment. We have three and a half million open jobs. We can't find enough people to fill the roles in cybersecurity that we seek. Uh, and why is that? Because cyber risk is escalating as technology is getting widely deployed. Guess what? The risk of kind of that technology getting hacked is also growing and we need more people to fight the good fight on our behalf because there is a lot of bad threat actors on the other side that are at, active. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, you know, with all of those job openings and, and one of the SDG goals is kind of gender parity and reduced inequality. How are you seeing that, you know, maybe women are being brought more into this field and able to fill some of those, those gaps? Absolutely. And I would broaden your point, Carol. We think of diversity not as sort of just, a, you know, gender as one of the traits. We think uh, back to sort of the neurolink example that Kathy raised as well. You know, I think we need to, we need to contemplate neurodiversity, right? And, and invite those people in. We need to think about Kind of domain diversity typically cybersecurity has been a very elitist field where people we've been you know if i may use a self-deprecating remark we've been stem snobs we think only people with stem degrees can actually be productive in the cybersecurity field but we need behavioral economics we need psychologists you know at the end of the day on the other side you have a human that is trying to use perhaps social engineering or other ways to kind of get us to do things that so I think we have to think of not just gender diversity, and we've done a ton of work, by the way, at the conference in San Francisco, we'll be holding a women in cyber tech kind of, you know, kind of a impact uh, session that, that will, will be our kind of ode to kind of, you know, gendering diversity. But I think we have to think about diversity much more broadly than, than just gender, at, at least in cybersecurity. Absolutely. It the, right. the country by country thing reminds me of that William Gibson quote, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> That's great. That is, that applies so well. Um, I think, yeah. you know, I know that we have 17 of these sustainable development goals and some of them seem so lofty when we go through them, but maybe to your point, Kathy, um, you know, it just, it's not quite evenly distributed yet. I mean, the first goal is no poverty first and foremost, um, zero hunger, good health and well-being and quality education. I think quality education really mm -hmm. kind of supports all of those other lofty goals first and foremost, for sure. But Sarah, um, in, in your work, 
uh, I know that you've also kind of uh, believe in, in, in that neurodiversity and um, bringing up sort of people that you wouldn't typically have in the field um, and bringing different perspectives oh, yeah. and backgrounds and education. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, a bit about me. I don't have a PhD or anything. I was um, uh, a teenage single mom. I went to junior college and then just graduated with a bachelor's of science, which is, I'm not putting it down, um, um, at UC Irvine in neurochemistry. And I just worked my way up, you know, at the bench, I was there for 20 years. So experience, there were some people that said, you know, you don't have a degree, but come work in my lab. And, you know, I worked my way up. So to have more people that realize you don't need that book degree, there's other ways to educate people. And like for me, I'm not the type that can sit, you know, I have ADHD and all that, and I'm not the type that can sit at a desk, which is why Oculus is great because it's 3D and I walk all around and everything and I'll go up to my whiteboard and everyone. So anyways, um, but yeah, if we can understand there's other ways to educate and people can, you know, learn other ways. So allowing, you know, the requirements for certain jobs, maybe people, you know, you can start lessening them because a lot of it is you need this degree, right? Requirement, a four year degree. But, you know, what if you realize that or, you know, you have the qualifications from some other means, you know, if we start doing that, you can see you'll start getting and encouraging people to go apply for this stuff. You don't have the degree, but maybe your life experience would allow you, or you're a good learner, right? You know, maybe I'm going to learn on the job. Give them a chance, you know, and then. Right. So, but that's a, you know, those are very good points. I'm definitely one about education and, you know, it doesn't have to be the same structure. That democratization is something it sounds like, Chris, that, you know, with your expansion into making MRIs so accessible, um, perhaps there's there's that point there as well, that you wouldn't have people needing quite as much specialized training. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, the democratization of healthcare is, is a very interesting subject, and it's also referred to as the retailization of healthcare services. You know, you're seeing Walgreens and CBSs and Walmart and you know everyone else kind of getting into this healthcare, um, you know, provide healthcare services, yeah. and you're going to see more of that. Um, you know, Walgreens, CVS, in particular, you know, I think you'll see less, you know, toothpaste aisles and mm-hmm. you know the convenience store type things, and and more of the. As long as they're you know, not it, a Theranos, Theranos uh, aisles. You know, I would like to say that. <laughs> That's that's been a challenge. Oh, so uh, mm-hmm. The challenge raising capital in a market. I'm sure, especially for women. Right. Well, in people, science, yeah. Well, there was a lot of very smart people that got burned by that, right? Right. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's a trend towards neighborhood yeah. providing neighborhood services, and I think we'll see that continue, and it'll bring down the cost of healthcare, and and what we're doing leads really well right into that. So we're really putting our faith in technology is what everybody's saying to make this leap. And here's here, you know, I follow the Chinese economy and write about it quite a bit. And over the last couple of years, um, the uh, Chinese government has been devouring its young. All of the big technology companies have suffered severe restrictions and falls in the market. And um, it looks like, you know, there could be the potential of innovation ending there because of government interference. Mm -hmm. So here in the U.S., I hate to say this, but I see a little similar political movement against technology in the United States. That things that are sound good, like sustainability and so forth and ESG, are really political statements meant to control in some way the growth of what we feel technology should be doing, that we're a little afraid of it and the growth of it. So I just wanted to ask everybody if they feel that that is a good characterization of what's going on and isn't that the biggest risk? I mean, overall productivity is just the ratio of inputs to outputs to create a good or service. That's all it is. So the what can help that is people working harder for less, for example, is makes things more productive, but also having technology is I think really where we have to put our faith. 
So my, my second quote for the night is, is uh, I believe it was Isaac Asimov who said that the problems, the major problems that we're going to have in the future will come from technologies that look like solutions today. And an example of that is email. Email was supposed to free us up. It was going to be great. You know, we were going to have so much productivity. Oh I God. probably spent three hours a day minimum reading emails wow. that nobody would ever put into a letter to me or, or a phone call. <laughs> and half of them are they're just copying me to copy me because I'm the CEO. And, <laughs> and so we have to be really careful about what technologies that we bring in. But you bring up a good point about fear. And, you know, you hear all this fear about AI and fear about CRISPR and things. And, and I keep telling people it's a hammer, that, that technology is a hammer. You can build a house. You can beat someone ahead. It's all how you use it. And, it's, and you have to be so mindful and thoughtful of, of how we're, we're implementing these things, but also the secondary impacts that they have on us. Um, in, my, in my spare time, I'm, I'm working on my, my doctorate right now. Uh, at Vanderbilt on trust. And it's really interesting, some of the research using fMRI machines, by the way, you can actually see mm -hmm. the part of the brain that lights up when, when that limbic system trust kicks in. Mm -hmm. And um, they're showing that, first of all, why do we care about trust? A lot of the research out of Harvard shows that high trust organizations not only provide, uh, they produce better decision making, People stay in their jobs longer, they're happier, they're less stressed, they're physically healthier, they lose less days off, they stay in the job. So it becomes more profitable for the company and better for the health and the well-being of, of the people. That's, that's why health is so critical, uh, the trust is so critical, but trust is actually implemented uh, in, in person in a different way that it comes out when you're working with someone on Zoom. And we have to figure out how, as we're working remotely, we facilitate trust and the relationships that are so necessary on the human level that you were just saying, as we use these technologies. We always have to remember there's that, that human impact to these things. And so much less trust in the world between people, between groups, between countries. And so maybe we should put our faith in trustless technologies, like trustless <laughs> <laughs> cryptocurrencies, for example, and mis yeah. misinformation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, with your with your um, vast knowledge into the the Chinese market, um, I find it really interesting because there seems to be a push and a pull there between so much creativity and innovation, and then the government's sort of innate. Um, uh, kind of proclivity to clamp down on such such things. It's about like, data. It's about data. They woke it, up one morning and they realized yeah. mm -hmm. that private companies were owning all this, knew more about what was going on in China than they did. Right. And that could be perceived as a threat. And I know there was a uh, the TikTok parent company, speaking of all that data, um, you know, TikTok is well known as kind of uh, collecting that data. And perhaps even mm -hmm. Rohit, you can speak to this, but being a cybersecurity threat in and of itself, right. even yeah. though it's perceived as a benign one. And yet, um, this is the parent company that is that is set to double e-commerce in China um, over the next few years or beyond. Um, so that's that's really interesting, Larry, that you that you kind of look to China and we can see some of these experiments in productivity right. and, and how they impact the entire world. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, just to comment on that, you know, our, our my view on that is that look. The, we live in the information age, you know, technology, you, you know, when we say IT, information technology, technology is really the container. The more important aspect is the information. And then, so it's all about the data to, to the next point of information. And we in cybersecurity for the first three or four decades of our existence focused on three things, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. He said, hey, hackers want to get in, they actually want to steal the data, or they want to kind of tamper with the data, or they want to make it unavailable so people will not be productive. Those are bad things, we want to avoid that. Right. But now we face a different frontier, which is about the veracity of information, not just about confidentiality, integrity, and availability, right? We can, you know, it's not, 
people don't need to steal information. They can just create disinformation campaigns by creating falsehood, by publishing information that is simply not true and brainwash the psyche of people and lead them to believe wrong things. And that's sort of a societal force that, you know, governments, organizations can wield in both a positive way and a negative way. You, you kind of, you know, to Kathy's hammer example. So I think, you know, there is, there is a, a ton of research going on in terms of, you know, what we can do in terms of veracity of information. And even today, if you think about information, most, most information that is consumed by humans is actually created by humans or created by bots on behalf of humans. So the brightest signal in terms of veracity of information is actually still the source. Where did it come from? Right. And I think we, we, as we think about SDG goals of, of countries and organizations and economies, I think we have to put that front and center. We have to put that front and center because we, we individuals and organizations and governments will make decisions based on data or information. If that data or information is tainted, will make wrong decisions. That's the threat that we face. So we have to protect the veracity of information which requires mandates to kind of, you know, publish not just the information, but the source of where it came from. Like in, in Twitter, right, you know, Elon, we are hearing all the news about Elon focusing on free speech. Mm -hmm. It needs to be that level of focus on veracity, right? You need to, when you look at a Twitter account, you should know whether that's a bot or an actual human. and you know, the reputation score of that, so you can interpret whether or not to believe what that tweet is saying. So I think, you know, I just want to raise that point around, uh, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, in those, I don't know, I don't even know if that list of 17 includes this idea of veracity of information, but it should, in my view, because. It definitely should. I, I believe, and I think Kathy would agree with you there with your work on trust, Kathy, mm -hmm. uh, that you were just citing recently. I mean, it, it really, if we can't have that fundamental, um, you know, trust of, of the information, then uh, everything else collapses, really. I mean, it's like even the trust of the government then, you know, saying the government can hold all this information. I mean, that's like a really big one um, to, to tackle. You know, I, I, the citizens of the country will have to have trust of their government, I think, would have to be a key you know, thing that, to have in that, place that, that these that goals are to bio, be biomedical breakthroughs, like the ones that you were just yeah. referring to in your research, Sarah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're they're because every time there's a need in this beautiful world, someone's there to try and fill it. And there are companies like Noble Profit, which I think they're doing great. They're using a blockchain to track the money. So if you donate to help some uh, women's organization in Peru, for example, oh, they will be able to track that money and be able to make sure that that goes to where it's intended. And then it comes back up in, in terms of feedback. I you love know, they're, that. They're beautiful mm -hmm. things that are being developed yes. now. Uh, Amy oh. Seidman's a woman doing it. An, mm -hmm. Another great woman in tech. And uh, I love that need being recognized and people yes. stepping up to it. Yes. They say only like 1% of grant money goes to a science project. Like even uh, Michael J. Fox Parkinson's Foundation, only like 1% actually goes to the science. Isn't that crazy? It's, it's, and like Genentech, only 5% of their company is the science. You know, it's like all this overhead. But yeah, no, those sort of things will really help people start trusting more what they do. Because even just having a little thing in your day make you feel like, oh, you were taken advantage of, that just throws you off probably for feeling like you're going to be open to trust anybody, you know? So all around, you can make people feel like, hey, I did that, and they really used it that way. That is a big need. I like hearing about that. That's really awesome. I, I mean, just <laughs> with the whole COVID crisis, we had to, you know, establish a whole new threshold of trust for people to be receptive to receiving vaccines and other treatments. And I imagine that's a similar kind of uh, barrier that you have to overcome. Chris, with your work is just, um, you know, establishing that trust factor 
and in, in making MRIs accessible um, and making that, you know, more the norm as we go forward. And as you said, um, with long COVID, it's going to be more and more of a necessity. Right. Yeah, we want, we want to be able to make it routine for people. It's part of their annual physical. I mean, best, the best prevention is, you know, I guess the best treatment is prevention, right? So if you can see what's happening in your body earlier, that's better. I um, had an opportunity to host a uh, health care class at the Sloan School, MIT, um, a health lab, and they did a they did some, a study for us on, you know, what we're kind of demand study and just helping us understand a bit some of our issues that we'll face. And the trust issue, they we look what we one major finding that kind of st- stood out was people trust their family doctors. They 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 you know, we'll, we'll, we're creating something that you can self-refer, self-pay. But at the end of the day, I mean, there are, people are going to, for our business, they're going to want to understand what their doctor has to say about it. And, and you know, the doctor recommendation matters a lot. So, um, and I think that maybe happened with COVID. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation. And I think a lot of people just talked to their doctor about it and got, you know, good information because there is a trust level there. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're going to have to wrap up soon. So I would love to hear from each of our panelists if you had just one sort of parting thought on how we can best advance these, these sustainable development goals that range everything from no poverty to zero hunger to gender equality to climate action. Um, if you could put that into just one nugget of wisdom for our, our audience. Well, I'll start and I'll just say one thing I got um, taking away from this is that I really think trust is at the heart of all this. The more we were talking about that, you know, I, I, um, I think that's definitely something that needs to be looked into a bit more, looked at when we make decisions, you know, and plan things. Well, yeah. And that fascinating. Now I'm pondering it now. <laughs> it is at the source of really everything when you go down. Right. I think I yeah. think the only thing we haven't talked about with that is um, the triple bottom line um, that you can have companies that are profitable, but they also do something that's good for the planet and good for people. And a lot of people look at companies that are doing good, that are profitable, very skeptically, you know, talking about yeah. trust. But more and more, it's becoming recognized that nonprofits, companies doing well, spend so much time fundraising rather than doing the actual thing they're trying to do, that there is nobility as well in being self-sustainable. And I think that we need to to reevaluate our necessity for everything being a nonprofit and Mm -hmm. recognize that a lot of companies are doing very, very good, very impactful things that are going to help productivity and quality of life. And they're and they're profitable at the same time, and I think that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. That's going to help them scale and really help the world. Lyric, uh, I'd love to hear from you as well. Could you unmute? Rohit, would you like to? Uh... Yeah, maybe I'm in. You know, my 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 not uh, the recommendation is. You know, we need to redefine productivity. And I like the idea of trust as well as the triple bottom line idea. Basically, we have to kind of think about output of productivity, not just in terms of economic terms, but in terms of humanistic terms and build a build a system that allows us to kind of measure that and showcase that. And when we stack rank companies or define success or productivity and positive metrics, we have to somehow put that front and center and get get um, you know, drive behavior, you know, it, it, we, we humans are driven by, uh, you know, numbers. I mean, we all kind of, you know, we look at, you know, we look at things that, you know, you start measuring a number, it drives behavior. <laughs> so, so my point is until we put a, put a metric to it or a number to it, that doesn't necessarily drive behavior. So I think there should be some effort put in to, to you know, create metrics around the SDG goal. That will then drive the necessary behavior to actually move the quotient or the triple bottom line quotient or whatever the other ends up being. But let's create the right measures of success and redefine productivity. 
Well, as an economist, Larry, I'm sure you'll have something to say about that as well. <laughs> I think that we have to be very careful about the roles that the different kinds of organizations in our world play. And the role of a company is to make a profit and employ people and so forth. I think we have to think carefully, what do we want companies to do? What do we, what is it that we're paying taxes to our government to do? And should we expect innovation from the government or from the private sector? Are we expecting too much from both sides? Are we mixing up these roles so that neither become effective? Definitely something to think about. Chris, any parting thoughts before we uh, wrap? It's a no, interesting discussion. I think back of Thomas Friedman's book of um, uh, thank you for being late. Uh, I don't know if you've read that, but I think our session's expired here. Um, <laughs> yes, the, uh, Cute. you know, this, things are accelerating. Technology is accelerating so fast. It's been among his main points that people in, in institutions are, are having a hard time keeping up with it. So I think that's the gap that we're in right now. And, uh, you know, just have to we need our institutions to, to you know, bridge that gap. We need people to be smart about information they consume. And, um, you know, that'll all You're lead to more productivity, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. This has been a really interesting and productive, if my, might I say, talk. <laughs> thank you so much. I hope that um, you enjoyed the discussion and um, I hope that I'll see you at a future process meeting. In person. In, in person. person. Great. And thank you for moderating, Carol. Thank, thank you. you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Hold on, before we before we leave, let me do a screenshot of everybody. Oh. Okay. okay, no blinking. Hold on. Oh, it's there. There we go. I always like to warn people so that somebody's not like making a weird face. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. All right, Pleasure. ready? One, two, three. Got it. <laughs> awesome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.